and uh, we're back. We took uh, a little hiatus for about a week, and uh, and now we're back. So um, so let's uh, let's see if we can get stuff going in. How's everybody doing? Nobody's there yet. There's a few people coming. Wes is here. Hello, Roger. Uh, that's nice. Hi, Wes. Um, thank you for tuning in every week that we're doing this. It's it's really nice to see the same group of people coming in. Um, got lots of interesting things that have happened over the last uh, couple of weeks since I've last been with you. Um, I decided that uh, with all the technical difficulties that I had last time um, because it just abruptly ended and I think everybody sort of got cut off that I'm going to redo this stout session and uh, post it properly so um, but again you know I'm trying new things I was trying to do it off my phone hello Michelle and hello Harold favorite time of the week that's nice um, yeah so I, I think we're gonna we're gonna redo the, um, the stout session and I'm going to completely rely on my laptop from here on in, which is nice because I know that it always works and it gives me the transmission I want. Hello, Joe. Um, so, uh, lots of really cool and interesting things these days uh, going on in the beer world. Some estimates that we're going to have um, more volume this year than we've ever had before, and, and that's, there's no wonder to that. Hello, Vess. Ah, you got and you got Beardmore. We're going to talk a little bit about Beardmore uh, now that you brought it up because it'll be good for you to have uh, those two things together, Bess. Um, try them back to back so that you can see what what the style is supposed to be like and and somebody else's interpretation of it. Um, yeah, lots of. Uh, I mean, I think people are drinking a lot more. There's a lot of interesting things going on. I think a lot of breweries over the last um, four months have actually made ends meet by doing home deliveries and curbside pickups and um, they've really started to understand that there's more of a retail business now but um, as with all things now that things are starting to open up again the whole delivery and curbside pickup is starting to drop off and a lot of these breweries are going to continue to need our help in Ontario and right across Canada because we, we do have to support local and we do have to support our Canadian brewers because they make wonderful beers um, even though today I'm featuring a, a German beer but there's uh, lots of interesting things happening hello Annie um, so there's uh, somebody was asking me uh, last night I had a little meeting last night and somebody was asking me what they what I thought the next big thing was and you know I know that we've seen lots of IPAs in the last 10 years and then you know sours are coming in and now this whole thing about really juicy thick IPAs which um, I know I've mentioned before but I, I just can't drink very much of them but I'm still of the mind that dark lagers um, could potentially be a big thing but we're also starting to see most craft brewers doing some form of sessionable lager so either a Pilsner, a Hellas or a Lagerdale like we're going to see tonight in a Kolsch. Um, but it's really hard. It, it's hard. It's hard to anticipate anything that's going on in the industry these days. Um, I think everything's been tossed on its, on its head. I was in Ottawa last week doing some training with the uh, Mill Street Beer Brew Pub. Um, I had a wonderful time uh, for two days training them, but also had a massive awakening when I went out um, to visit with a few of my customers which were pub owners and, and pub managers and um, it absolutely blew me away um, the lack of um, guests that were in there and it, it just made me feel really sad that hospitality is one of those areas in, um, in the industry and in Canadian jobs that is probably going to be hit the hardest and um, you know it's nice to see that our jobs are coming back but um, most of the unemployment figures are based on full-time work and hospitality workers aren't full-time employed for the most part so they usually have two or three jobs so 
it's really kind of interesting to to uh, take a look and see where things are right now. I'm not so sure that it's, it's going to correct itself quickly. I think a lot of people want to correct things quickly and I think they want to get back into bars and restaurants and have a really nice draft beer. But I suspect that it's going to be a slow ride. Um, at Prudhomme Beer Certification, things are changing as well. Um, we're in September starting full stream back into it, although our classes are going to be significantly smaller, so we're keeping them at a maximum of eight, which allows us to distance at two meters. Um, we're starting with a level one class in Kitchener, which um, we still haven't seen a lot of registration yet, but we still got lots of time because it's not starting until the middle of September. Our level two class at Steam Whistle is almost full. There's one more spot left. My level three classes, I have two of them this year. Uh, they're going full bore. I think we've got uh, five in each of those classes, and I'll be happy if it stays at that. And I've actually got nine people signed up for a level four master sommelier program that runs you know, twice a month for the entire year. And on top of that, we've still got lots of online opportunities for anybody that's out there. Um, but I'll have some news in the next little while. I am going through um, a subtle rebranding change for Prudhomme, and we're going to start um, becoming a little bit more Canadian-centric wherever we can. So new logos are coming, uh, a new look, new support uh, vehicles, and... Uh, yeah, it should be fun over the next little while, and uh, lots of tastings. So um, why don't we why don't we get into this? Because um, this is a really unique style that that we're talking about. Um, before we actually pour the beer, I'll just tell you a little bit. A Kolsch is a geographical protection. Uh, it, that means that it's very similar to things like champagne or cognac, where they can't be called those names unless they come from that particular area. And Kolsch, um, the proper way to pronounce it is Kolsch. So you actually have to um, take it to an O-E kind of sound together. Um, but I'm, I'm perfectly fine with everybody pronouncing it as Kolsch. It, it typically is a lot easier to pronounce. So um, I've chosen Gaffel Kolsch. Um, Vess has got um, a Kolsch from Beardmore. But the thing with a naming convention is in Europe, this is a protected designation. That means that you cannot call anything a Kolsch unless it actually comes from a 50 mile kilometer radius around Cologne and to date there are only 13 breweries in um, in Cologne that are actually brewing coaches um, so um, the type of glass that you would typically use and, and before I get into the pouring is something called a Stange and a Stange means a pole or a rod in German it's a very straight sided glass um, this one I got from Royal City. They do a really nice low glass. They're typically 20 centiliters. They're, they're typically very, very small. And the servers will come around with these things filled to the top. And the way that you stop is by putting your coaster on the top. Otherwise, they just tick off how many you've had and they keep removing them. Um, I don't have, um, I don't think I want a 20 centiliter glass today. I think I want um, a little bit bigger. So um, I've got Gaffel Kolsch. I'm going to use this uh, very straight sided glass. It's got a big rig logo on it, but uh, I really like this glass as well. So if you've got a nice straight sided glass, that's the thing to do. Um, with these narrow glasses, you do have to be a little bit more careful when you pour because the, the foam can increase dramatically very, very quickly. And as always, we want about two fingers of foam at the top of the glass. So, um, Prost, zum Wohl, um, Gesundheit. Which doesn't mean um, you know that you've sneezed. It means uh, bless you. Um, so it's uh, let's talk a little bit about you know the kinds of things that you're going to uh, find in a coal. So a coal is a lager ale, which means that it uses ale yeasts, which typically are top fermenting, and it applies lager techniques. So once it's finished fermenting, what they do is they take it and they ferment it or they age it over a much longer period of time. So instead of four days to 10 days, they're probably more in the um, 21 day range and also at extremely cold temperatures. The benefit of lagering is that it smooths out the beer. It allows any of the volatile aromas that are created through fermentation to escape. And it creates a beer that is clean and crisp. So a Kolsch is a hybrid style. This is what we would call a hybrid style or a lagered ale. 
Um, the benefit of this is that you get a little bit of both. So you'll get a little bit of the fruity aromatics. If you smell it, um, you're probably going to get notes like um, a little bit of apple, a little bit of pear. Um, not a lot um, on those notes. So very subtle fruitiness. Um, but you'll also get some of the German characteristics from the German hops. So you should be able to pick up some fresh cut grass, straw, hay. Uh, a little bit of tea in there as well. Some breadiness, um, typically bread crust, like think about um, a bread that's just come out of the oven, you've got this really nice golden crust on it, it's got that beautiful smell. That's the kind of thing that you're really looking for. These are relatively simplistic beers, just like Pilsner's and Hellas's are. So when you're ready, take a sip. And you can see that it's extremely thirst quenching. It's got a very quick finish. It has um, a touch of an aftertaste, not very much, but there's a, a touch of bitterness on the back end. And the bitterness is there to help cleanse our palate. Um, all the fruitiness is pretty much gone out of the body of the beer. And really what we're left with right now is a little bit of that um, fresh cut grass straw uh, characteristic, but also uh, more of the breads. So you're gonna get more of that bread crust. Um, relatively simple beer. They they should be, by German standards, um, pale golden in color. Um, you know, a little bit of sunlight, um, very pale, almost lemon uh, color to it. And then crystal clear, because uh, German brewers are renowned for, for clarification, which comes through the water tongue, but also through filtration. But that's what we want in this, this style of beer. It's very, very close to a German Pilsner, and there's a reason for that. Yeah, it's, it's really, really refreshing. Um, this beer used to, um, a few years ago, come in bottles. And, um, you know, one of the interesting things, I had, uh, had a meeting with, with uh, one of my customers the other day. Oh, Michelle likes it. It's delicious. It is. Um, but this beer used to come in, in bottles, but now it's coming in cans. We have this, uh, this thing in the, in the Canadian beer industry right now, and the cans are, are a really big topic before I get into the history behind cultures, but um, I think almost everybody's heard that the Americans are applying tariffs on aluminum, which is um, laughable in some ways because all of the aluminum that goes down to be turned into cans in the United States actually comes from Canada. So I think to avoid this in the future, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to start making cans in Canada. We do make some, but not a lot. Um, so the interesting thing that I heard the other day was that in Germany, uh, brewers are fighting tooth and nail to maintain glass bottles as their method of putting their beer into, um, as opposed to cans. The Germans do not, they do not prefer cans. They know that that can is not the same as what it would taste like in the bottle or in the keg. Um, and that's because they, they simply have more oxygen in them and less CO2. And there's just a completely different flavor. So I'm a big fan of, of having my beer packaged into a bottle. Um, but everybody has pushed so hard for cans recently. And it's been the LCBO that's primarily been driving that agenda. This is a retail agenda that's been driven for a long period of time. Back in, you know, mid-1990s, the amount of cans that were in the marketplace was about 19% of total beer volume. So, you know, it was about 10% draft, so that's 29%. So the remainder of it was all glass, it was bottled. Um, and now, in 2019, we have 65% can, 25% bottles, and 10% draft, or 11% draft, which is really wacky. Um, I know there's a lot of benefit to cans, but really, if you ever have the same beer out of a, a glass bottle, it's unbelievably different. It's really kind of cool. So, you're enjoying your uh, your Kolsch right now, um, and, and that's when you have the two of them together, what I want you to look for is the differences between those two. So, Beardmore is not a bad beer. Um, for me, it's just not a Kolsch. It's a Lagerdale. It doesn't fit with a Kolsch. It's got way too much sweetness up front. Um, it's definitely hazy, so they don't filter it. Um, I think the time I tried it in one of my classes, there was something not 100% right with it. Um, 
So it's it's a decent beer, um, but for me it's not a Kolsch, and it's one of the reasons that they can put Kolsch style on there, because if you call it a Kolsch, in theory you're not really um, you know, having a true Kolsch because it's not made in Cologne. Now, the I'll, I'll get into a little bit more of the geographical protection as a whole, but um, Cologne is a very, very interesting city. So it, it is along the Rhine, and it's sort of midway in Germany. And Cologne has um, wonderful architecture. It has uh, wonderful vineyards. The Rhinelands are, are really renowned for the vineyards. Um, but it also has a massive history on brewing. Um, let me just check uh, Vessa's point. Uh, beer more has got a little bit more body, uh, a little sweeter, bready taste touch darker yeah the body is really because they don't filter and so a lot more of that body is coming out because they don't filter and also it's it's touch darker so in uh, 1461 a brewers guild was founded in Cologne Germany and the brewers guild was there to basically uh, help brewers to adhere to the the constrictions that were put upon them about the government at that time and they and, and bear in mind that Germany was not unified at that time, so it would have been probably a series of different provinces. But throughout um, that area, there were a lot of different laws that, that you had to use local products and they had to use certain kind of malt. So Brewers Guild in uh, Cologne has been um, one of the oldest in Germany and um, one of the most prolific as well because it's had a lot of influence on how they've moved forward. So. Let's let's move forward a few hundred years and move into the um, into the 1600s. Um, in the 1600s, and specifically in 1676, and also in 1698, the um, the the city government uh, tried extremely hard to pass laws that would prohibit any bottom fermenting beers from being produced or even being brought into the city limits. So they started taxing anything that was bottom fermented. So even back in those days, they still heavily believed in top fermenting beers, and they really didn't want these, these lagers to actually come in. And in 1750, they started experimenting with top fermenting yeast, but also starting to condition their beers like lagers. So they were starting to go into cold conditioning and longer aging times as well. So. Um, then things um, went sideways for the brewers in Cologne and they were extremely uh, concerned with some of the, the developments within the beer community. Sorry, gotta have a sip. So, um, so let's, let's move uh, south now. Um, if you remember that in 1842 uh, something was created in Pilsen that completely changed the brewing industry and completely changed the way we as consumers saw beers and enjoyed beers and that was the development of the Pilsner. It was the first golden clear beer in the world and um, it took everything by storm. Everybody started to want to drink it. Now the big thing is in, um, in Bavaria they started doing other things. They started creating things like helices. Um, whereas more in the mid to northern part of Germany, pilsners were starting to be created from a German perspective and not necessarily from a bohemian perspective. So um, easier to drink, lighter in color, more thirst quenching. Well, this causes a big problem for the Brewers Guild in Cologne and because pilsners are so dominant within Central Europe that the brewers in Cologne felt threatened and felt extremely concerned. So they did two things. They basically increased the taxes so high that Pilsners could not come in. They virtually barred the gates to Cologne. So imagine the city is surrounded by gates. They virtually barred the gates to Cologne in order to keep Pilsners out because they were threatened that if Pilsners came in, it would destroy their brewing community. And to be honest, they were probably right. So what they did instead was they adopted the same kind of principles behind brewing but maintained using ale yeasts. And there are really only two main places in Germany that continue to use ale yeasts. One would be Cologne and the other would be Düsseldorf. And Düsseldorf makes 
an alt beer, which is more of an amber colored beer, um, but still top fermenting um, yeast strains. So, um, so the brewers in Cologne then started moving to lighter colored malts um, and did the fermenting as they would normally do with ales and then dropped the temperature down so that they started lagering their beers over longer periods of time. And you end up with what we have right now, which is a Kölsch. Um, this is a really unique style. The style didn't really take off until um, the, the 19, early 1900s, right around the war, around 1918 is when Kölsch has really started to grow in demand and in popularity. And then as everything, they, they came and went. Um, and in 1986, um, the Kolsch Convention was created. And the Kolsch Convention basically stipulates that you may not call your beer a Kolsch unless it is brewed within a 50 kilometer radius around Cologne. Um, and to this day, and, and there are very strict principles in which they have to brew. So certain yeast strains that they have to use, certain types of malts that they have to use, certain, um, certain ways of producing their beers. And to this day, there are really only 13 brewers in Cologne that are producing uh, traditional Kölsch styles. Uh, we've seen a few more of those here in Canada, so you'll see a lot of Lagerdales. Um, primarily, Bose um, has always been a, a really good Lagerdale. When Bose first entered the market, can't even remember when, early 2000s, um, the first branding on a Bose bottle was as a Kölsch. Um, so um, a lot of a lot of you're, you're going to see lots of Lagerdales out there. Um, more domestic style Lagerdales um, include uh, things like Alexander Keys and Molson Export and Labatt 50. So those are beers that use ale yeast but ferment um, typically and age at lager temperatures. Although all those beers probably aren't at a full 21 day. Sleem and Cream Ale, another one. The Cream Ales are North American hybrids based on the Coach Convention. So those were created back in the 1800s. Um, so anytime you see a cream ale in Canada, the uh, it should be light golden in color, just like this. It's going to use, um, it is, the difference between a cream ale and a coach is, a coach is really all, all malt um, to, the Bavaria, to the Puri Act, uh, whereas a cream ale always has a small amount of corn in it, which has been around since the 1800s, which is what Sleeman originally produce so so I'm gonna uh, open it up to you guys that's uh, my story for today that's a uh, Kolsch hope you're enjoying it um, I love this brand um, it is one of those beers that um, I really love to feature because um, people take a drink of it and they really enjoy it um, it's really nice easy to drink thirst quenching you can find it in most LCBOs you cannot find it in the beer store um, you just have to look around a little bit. So, um, any questions on anything beer related, coach, journey, drinking, whatever you want, or enjoying? Give me a short day. trying to think who else um, is doing this style. Oh, um, Cowbell, um, which is in Blythe, Ontario, they do a beer called Absent Landlord, and again, it is a cold style. It, I really like that beer. Um, it's not as clear as this one, and, um, you know, it's got a little bit of a different aroma, but then um, the aromatics using... Um, Canadian ale yeast are different than the ones they use in German. I've asked a good question. Next week, what are we doing? Next week on uh, on Wednesday, on September 2nd, damn, like September's here already, um, I'm going to be visiting Vienna, and we are going to talk about Vienna lagers. Um, specifically, I'm going to feature Hop City's Barking Squirrel, but there are some other Vienna lagers that I will recommend. Um, if you want to go out and see if you can find a Dolceki's Amber, it's one of the uh, original Vienna lagers that have been in the marketplace for a while. Um, Thornberry, uh, let me just think, Ladder Run is um, a really good Vienna style as well. I really like what, what they're doing. 
There are a few others out there. I'll see if I can dig up in my archives some of the other um, beers that you, you can take a look at. But Hop City's Barking Squirrel to me is the standard right now. Uh, Michelle, is there any more in the fridge for me? I have more for you, yes. And, uh, Michelle and Joe are visiting um, and um, watching from, from a distance, I think. But I do have more, yes. Um, so uh, that's an interesting question. Anything else from, uh, from anyone? We're getting um, near the end of the sessions. I think I've got about four or five sessions. Um, yeah, Harold, Harold makes a good point. Great Lakes put one out. Um, they've been doing... Uh, Great Lakes is kind of interesting because they um, have had a beer for a long period of time called Red Leaf, which I always thought was a pretty decent Vienna lager. And then a few years ago, they tweaked it and came up with a different recipe and actually did a Vienna lager, and it's really nice. It's a little subtler than Red Leaf. It doesn't have quite the body to it. Um, so, um, yeah, lots of, lots of interesting things, but um, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to... Um, I'll see if I can post what the schedule is ahead of time so that you can see the kinds of things, because there's one particular beer that I'm going to feature... Um, in the coming weeks that will be a little bit more difficult to get and I picked one up the other day because I was in Toronto and I saw it so um, I'll post it. It is a smoke beer from Germany. It's called Echt Schlenkeller Rauch Beer and I'll have some great stories about that one. Um, yeah um, yeah, so as the summer ends, as, as we come close to an end, the sort of unofficial end of summer, which is Labor Day weekend, um, just want to wish you all the best. Have, um, have a great weekend coming up. Have a great Labor Day weekend. I will see you uh, next week on, um, on Wednesday at 6 p.m. again. Steve, thank you very much. Steve was, uh, was sitting off in the... In the side, uh, Harold, the bacon beer, exactly, yes. Schlenkeller Rauch beer smells like campfire and bacon. It is a really cool beer. Uh, good good question, Wes. Uh, Rathman, a smoke beer, yes, but subtle, subtle, subtle. Um, I'll have some other smoke beers that we can do. Um, uh, Church Key Holy Smoke is excellent. Um, also... Oh, I'm trying to think. Highlander up in South River at the uh, edge of Algonquin Park makes a great smoked porter uh, as well. And the Alaska, the, the smoked porter that Highlander does is outstanding. Uh, Barry, you're here as, as well. That's that's nice. Thank you for joining. Um, anyway, I'm going to um, shut it off right now. I think um, we've had a, a great session. Hopefully you guys enjoy the stories and the beer.